Hello everybody, it's AJ back again with the TMG channel. How's it going? Nice to see you. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about the Flail Snail. And uh, this had its debut back in uh, the Fiend Folio, which is a, um old monster manual that was produced in the UK. And has been the... it generated so many weird and wondrous creatures that have um, persisted as fan favorites for a very long time and the flail snail is one such critter um, the origin of the flail snail I think um, stems back to in ancient medieval manuscripts uh, the snail was seen as like there was a correlation between the heavily armored but cumbersome knights and a snail that carries its shell on its back and so in manuscripts and things they would quite often illustrate a knight um, kind of shocked and scared fighting a snail. Um, this was considered to be medieval gothic humour. Um, and yeah, it was actually studied by somebody back in the 1960s. Um, and you find these illustrations all over the place. Okay, so the flail snail's origin um, is mysterious and its ecology is kind of complicated. They are gastropods, they're snails. Some sources will tell you that they are silicon based um, and come from another plane of existence. Um, and some will tell you that they're just ordinary, very large snails that have a, a couple of really unique characteristics and they've evolved this amazing shell. So in appearance, they are large, they're, they're very big. Um, they uh, stand about um, eight foot high at the, um, at, at the sort of the top of the shell um, so eight foot tall on average and they live for about 20 years by most accounts uh, their shell is covered in kaleidoscopic colors so at all colors of the spectrum um, in a rainbow crazy hue of various patterns and things. It's, a, it's described, described as the, being equivalent to a, a scintillating robe, um, which is a spell which actually reflects um, magic it, itself. And their shell has that same quality, that it can actually disrupt and deflect, um, even rebound spells that are directed against them. It is of no use to them against area effect spells. However, they do quite often have the ability to withdraw completely into their shell, which boosts their armor class to an enormous degree, which um, is very handy. And um, yeah, it's, there's no point having a shell unless you can kind of retreat into it. And it, it uh, protects their vital organs and um, is a home away from home with the home they carry with them. So, they eat lichen and algae and uh, any sort of other stuff that they find. Um, they are pretty strictly subterranean um, and travel everywhere in the underdark um, and underground caverns and uh, streams and things like that. Um, they're capable of traveling throughout the underdark pretty much unimpeded um, and they are very tough. Um, and yeah, so they can um, spin two types of or exude two types of slime. Uh, one is a sort of a, a gooey, um, sticky, highly viscous slime. Um, strands of it can be spun out into ropes and things like that. And the other is basically just a liquid sort of slime that they, they slide around on that lubricates their uh, shell and their movements. And um they yeah they can actually exude a, a a rope or a cable um of slime that they can climb up dungeon walls and uh abseil up and down uh, or repel up and down um caverns and things like that so they can actually get around all sorts of different environments um, even shear surfaces and things like that or impassable terrain can be traversed by spinning slime kind of like a spider web um, and they can of course slide up and down any surface that they can stick their, um, their muscular foot to. They are um, they differ from their smaller um, kindred mainly in size and the magical shells 
and these powerful antennae that they've adapted to uh, become bony flails uh, on the front of their body. So their movement is slow, um, like a an ordinary smaller snail, and most of its day is spent um, slowly tracking around and eating um, with its gnawing sort of mouth parts called a radula and a long ribbon tongue studded with, um, it's, it's like a, a tongue that's studded with thousands of tiny teeth that it rasps away at um, organic matter from stone, um, shredding it into pieces for digestion. So they also eat um, all sorts of other stuff and the mineral, it's thought that the minerals and things that they ingest in the underground, uh, particularly the deep underdark, contribute to the magic deflecting shells properties although it's been studied many times it's never been really replicated very well um, and mages are a bit mystified as to how they actually do it it's some sort of biological process they don't fully understand so they're left to try to harvest whatever they can to make whatever items they can and it's um, a very important substance in anti-magic um, alchemy so like other slugs and snails, uh, these tentacle-like protrusions on the snail's head are its primary sensory organs, um, and they s the top pair sense light and the lower provide a sense of smell, and handling most tactile and fine manipulation duties. They also are depicted as having a pair of nubbin sort of tentacles out the side of their body. These um, are also sensory organs. Um, heat detecting heat and um, uh, various other types of things. They have very poor eyesight. Um, they don't generally need it in the underdark because it's usually quite dark. Um, but they do have a lot of sensitivity to vibration and uh, smell and um, sound. So yeah, they can manipulate things with these little nubbin um, tentacles or they can um, manipulate things quite finely actually with the uh, the bony knobs and things which are on the end of their flail antennae. They also have a lot of fine rope-like tendons um, and muscles which propel those whipping um, flails with tremendous force and one of them is quite capable of staving in the chest of an armoured human um, and turning them into pulp. They are born in clutches of up to 30 eggs that they stick to cavern walls or bury them beneath interesting objects such as altars or lost treasure hoards. Um, and that's quite often where adventurers will come a cropper of the rage of the flail snails because unlike many other types of snails, they, are, um, they look after their young, they rear their young. Although the young have no concept of who their mummy or daddy is, if there's any group of them around, they all lay their eggs in the same place and they make no distinction between their offspring and anybody else's. Um, like most other snails, they are hermaphrodites, although they do actually couple with each other, they go off and lay their own individual clutches of eggs. Their mating process is fairly long and drawn out, it can take hours or days, where they um, entwine their bodies and ascend from massive rope and slime ropes hanging from um, caverns uh, ceilings until they're finished, at which point they um, they quite often need to gnaw off their reproductive organs need, in order to separate. Um, they also have this wonderful um, aspect of spearing themselves um, and their partners with these uh, chitinous spears, which they stab into each other, um, injecting hormones, which both signal their intent to mate and entice and inflame their, um, their projective partner. So it's it's a bizarre process and um, kind of gross to, to witness, but that's that's how they do it. Under duress, uh, they have been observed to retract completely into their shells, going into long periods of hibernation, making it possible for them to stay in there um, for a long time. And some flail snails, therefore, are far older than anyone realizes um, because they go into a sort of a hibernation like that and can live um, sealed up like that for a very long time. So if the environment ever becomes uh, particularly harsh, they can seal themselves up in their shells until, um, until better times ensue. This also allows them to survive cave-ins and uh, 
being um, dropped into raging waters and things and propelled for miles and miles. They just seal themselves up in their shells and um, sleep, consuming very few resources until which time as uh, whatever sense wakes them up, tells them it's okay again and they come back out. Um, they are yeah, cloaked in this amazing shell, which is a magnificent spiral construction uh, with a several inch thick wall um, of the shell, and the shell grows slowly over time, generated by an organ on its back known as its mantle, uh, which is in turn fed by metals and minerals scraped in tiny amounts from the stone as it ingests other dietary needs, and a wide variety of substances um, are secreted from the mantle in a specific order which produces this amazing worlds of uh, color and strange patterns that cover it. Uh, they often glow after being targeted by magical effects so there is some sort of energy interaction which goes on. Uh, exactly how the shell manages to reflect magic has baffled scholars for years um, and they put forth numerous theories, many of which may have an element of truth. Some suggest it's due to the ingestion and combina combination of magically active metals. Uh, others posit that the spells are focused for the snail's own magical energies, and by the whim of the gods, or evolution of the snail has been restricted to using its powers in a retributive manner. Um, some others maintain that the shell itself resonates with magic like a bell, um, acting as a sort of magical tuning fork whose vibration scatters the waves of energy and that they're actually magically attuned um, to help them avoid areas of damaging energy from incursions into the far realm in the lower underdark. Perhaps the most compelling argument is that it's not the shell's composition that is the key but rather its shape. This theory holds that the sh flail's um, shell has evolved in a perfect golden spiral, a shape long significant, significant significant to arcanists and engineers and it uh, manages to draw magical energy into its center and then expel it again in a new direction like a whirlpool or tornado however nobody really knows they have a kind of society of their own um, they are slow and ponderous and often written off as sort of dumb beasts by fast and moving races and afforded the same cautious respect as a bull in a pasture but otherwise ignored they are, however, quite dangerous when roused, and they do have an intelligence, it's an alien form of intelligence with thousands of years of racial history, and um, it's not a humanoid intelligence, and they, they're not interested in humanoid things, um, including speaking. So uh, anyone who manages to communicate with a flail snail might find the conversation extremely dull and slow. Uh, viewing every thought and details as separated and unrelated from others. Yet, monks and scholars who have managed to commune with the things recognize the um, snails actually have a Zen poetry um, going on in their thought processes that is incredibly deep and holds deep revelations about the environment that they live in and their attunement with the world of the Underdark. And they are generally perfectly calm and have a peaceful mind and fairly meditative um, which yeah they have a sort of a pastoral free roaming freedom that um, doesn't allow them to understand civilization or the needs and wants and urgent um, actions of the humanoid races which pass them by they have no spoken language and um, they communicate solely by um, the sign language of waving their tentacles around and scraping them and banging them um, and other messages which are picked up and passed through various other means that the, the snails communicate with. However, this is extremely hard for um, humanoids to pick up on, particularly in the dark of the Underdark where they don't really see these patterns very well and don't understand what they signify. So the flail snail may actually be waving its tentacles around in some sort of complicated slow greeting or inquisi inquisition an inquiry as to what you are and what you want and also possibly a warning telling you that you're getting too close and it's going to attack you. They don't build structures or cities um, and it's very hard to tell that they've been around other than the fact that they do actually grind up and smooth over areas 
Um, so gradually their processes of going back and forth over areas which are prone to producing lots of algae will have them widen and um, smooth out corridors um, so that they are sort of a uniform uh, 10 foot by 10 foot space, um, usually quite round, that allows them to fit their shells through. And since they can um, move around any sort of surface, those corridors are usually in the form of sort of round tunnels and things. Um, so they may find their way along the paths led by larger creatures, larger burrowing creatures, and um, create passageways which stretch for miles and miles and miles, quite often sheer passages um, that move up and down. And you may occasionally come across them um, cocooned up or um, their shell seemingly dormant, which has been um, stuck to a cavern wall or a ceiling um, or gooped into a corner and covered with its preservative sticky goo um, where they've been hibernating for years and years at a time. In a campaign, they are perfect monsters to shake up subterranean adventures, um, especially for parties heavy on spellcasters where their magic warping shells uh, come into play. They do have um, some converted stats, um, which uh, I've taken the liberty of uh, tracking down for 5th edition. So, they are a large monstrosity. Uh, the body can stretch um, usually between 8 and 12 feet in length, although it's very elastic, so it can uh, stretch even further than that. And they can squeeze it into um, quite confined spaces. And they are actually capable of leaving their shell altogether, um, particularly if the shell becomes nabbed on something or so damaged that it is actually more bothersome to have it than not. Uh, so they can leave their shell and squeeze through quite tight areas and then slowly reform their shell again. Although it will take years for it to uh, fully sort of recover and it'll never look completely right. So they have an armor class of 14, natural armor. Uh, they've got 34 hit points, uh, 40, 10 plus 12 hit dice. Uh, the speed is 10 feet per round. They've got a strength of 17, a dexterity of six, uh, constitution of 16, Intelligence of 5, Wisdom of 10, and Charisma of 8. They have a bonus of plus 5 to the Constitution saving throws, Dark Vision out to 60 feet, although it is poor, uh, and Passive Perception of 10, mainly related to smell and vibration. They have damage immunities to fire and poison, uh, no lo language that uh, humanoids can really communicate very well in. They've got a challenge rating of 3 and they're worth 700 experience points. The magic warping of their shell um, is represented as an 80% chance that a spell directed at them produces a random effect instead of affecting the snail. Um, so when that occurs, you roll a d10. Uh, on a roll, result of 1 to 3, the spell misfires and for the next uh, d4 rounds, the caster make must make a DC 10 plus spell level of the misfired spell constitution saving throw to successfully cast spells. So it actually disrupts their spell casting ability, which can be quite devastating in a combat with something else involved. Uh, on a roll of four, or, uh, 4, 5 or 6, the spell misfires and the creature nearest the flail snail is affected as if the spell had been cast on it instead. This also includes something like magic missile, which are normally unerring, but can actually be uh, me redirected. On a roll result of 7 to 9, the spell fails and just fizzles. Nothing happens. It redirects through the shell and goes nowhere. And on a result of 10, it rebounds and hits the caster full force for exactly what it was trying to he was he or she was trying to do to the snail. They are sensitive to sunlight and they have that typical disadvantage on attack rolls and perception checks made that rely on sight. Although uh, typically they don't use sight for a lot and they're normally within melee range when they're using their flail attacks. Um, and they don't really rely a lot on sight for that, so it doesn't affect them greatly, but it does affect their navigation. And if you uh, happen to be riding a tamed one or something like that, it can be disruptive. They have a multi-attack, 
Normally they grow between four and six flails on the front of their body, um, and they can attack with four of those uh, um, antennae flails during a round. Um, each one can attack an individual target. They can attack different targets or double up or all concentrate their attack on one target. Um, so it's plus five to hit, five foot reach, and does five points or 1d4 plus three bludgeoning damage. Uh, they can react and retract into their shell and they pull all their fleshy parts into the shell, uh, seal it off and increase their natural armor bonus by plus six. So the armor class goes from uh, 14 to 20. So they, they become one of the more impregnable creatures in the game. Um, they also have the ability in many cases um, particularly in uh, versions that were available for Pathfinder, uh, to create um, slime ropes and uh, to use their mucus um, as a secretion that covers a space, a ground space. Um, so you could say that it, it covers a, like a five foot trail um, and any creature that goes into it must make a DC 14 reflex save or fall over prone because the sticky mucus is designed to make footing almost impossible. It's like walking around on ice. Um, the snails can move around and create an increasingly large area of the stuff. Um, and if you want to get more complicated, you could say that the, um, the snails are capable of producing a mucus which is highly flammable. And they are capable of striking their flail against stone, which creates sparks, which creates a wall of fire. Of course, um, in the 5th edition version, they're immune to fire. So this is a great advantage to them and highly dangerous to anybody underground because not only does the um, conflagration create quite a serious barrier or trap you in an inferno, it also sucks up all the oxygen and will create an area where you can't breathe um, if it's a sealed off uh, cavern or something. Uh, the rope that they can produce um, can extend out to about 60 feet in a round and uh, it can hang itself in up, in up to 1,000 pounds from a ceiling indefinitely. Uh, or lower itself safely at a speed of about 20 feet per round and climb back up at its usual sedate pace of 10 feet per round. Um, once the snail breaks contact with the rope, it decomposes in a matter of D4 rounds. Uh, it just dries out basically and uh, denatures kind of like dried up jello. It just re reverts to a, a sort of a powder. Um, when it does exist though, the creature can, um, any other creature can climb the rope except it's very difficult uh, because the stuff is very slimy, it's like trying to cut, climb up um, a rope covered in ice. So it's a DC 20 climb check for anybody who's not basically born and raised doing this. And yeah, they, um, they are able to suction themselves to the ground so it makes it damn near impossible to pick them up, uh, grapple, move them or knock them prone. Um, yeah, you can't upend a, a flail snail when they know you're coming. Um, you could say that they have advantage on a strength check when they are aware that somebody's trying to knock them over. So yeah, that's flail snails for you. Um, many people in the Underdark do use them as uh, pack animals and um, as uh, riding creatures. They are intelligent and fairly friendly, and if you get on well with them and feed them well and raise them well, um, they can be wonderful companions, and um, they're not entirely stupid, and are very peaceful and sedate, and um, also attack anybody who attacks you, so yeah, they're pretty good. However, they do get um, pretty unruly, and if a wildflower snail is around and manages to spear one with a hormone dart, then your best bet is to stay away and just give up on anything to do with them for you know a week or so um, as the breeding process ensues. Yeah, that's that's it really. Um, there, I guess you could say their only real motivation um, is the only real tradable thing you could give them if you could manage to communicate with them would be knowledge, um, history, poetry, um, aesthetic sort of appreciations, riddles, that sort of thing. Um, but 
yeah, it's very hard to comprehend what a snail wants other than a snack and everybody leaving it alone. Yeah, they're distributed pretty much everywhere in the Underdark and you can come across them in all sorts of different places. Um, due to the fact that they are migratory and move around all the time and are capable of following the trails of other burrowing creatures, they can pop up pretty much anywhere. And uh, wizards, of course, will tend to collect um, the snails. They, when they're babies, they're only about the size of your hand um, and they grow pretty slowly over that 20-year um, that lifespan. Um, they'll be fully grown by about five years or so, um, but they are quite transportable when they're um, in a sort of cyst-like egg or when they're little babies. Um, and they're pretty tough. They can um, retract into that shell at an early age and be carried for long distances. So they're fairly valuable to a mage who wants to study them. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, yeah, I, I've certainly enjoyed uh, sculpting the um, flail snail that you've seen on display here. Um, that's basically just a, um, a frame, an internal frame made out of tin foil, um, aluminum foil, uh, which has been scrunched up and then it's been covered in Sculpey and um, I've sort of glued it all together after painting the individual parts. So yeah, it's not too complicated. Um, it was just the painting process was kind of uh, hellacious with that shell and the spikes were stuck on separately um, afterwards you know, just using epoxy glue. So yeah, not too complicated. I'm sure anybody can do it. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, more videos very shortly.